Imagine moving into a new apartment and they're like, oh, did you have to, to put up first month's rent for the safety deposit? No, I just had to put up the body of the outlaw who wouldn't quit. <laughs> <laughs> I just had the, the, the body of, of the, the outlaw who would never be captured alive laying around. I put that man up. I had a shrunken head that my uncle gave me when I was 10 years old and they accepted it. They took it. Gave me a loan, no questions asked. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Unbelievable, the podcast where I, failed bank robber Kurt Danner, tell my friend, escaped wax museum figure Luis Mejia, two unbelievable stories from history, one of them true, one of them false. And it's up to me to figure out which is which. Luis, I hope that you have your cowboy hat and boots nearby you somewhere because it is my pleasure to tell you today we are going west. Uh. Perhaps not the wild west, we're a little bit too late in history for that, but on this podcast, Podcast, we're always getting wild, so it may as well be the wild we're, west. We're going to the mild west. The mild west, the <laughs> wild west. It's it's what you make of it over here on this recording, okay? The wild west was the friends we made along the way. Exactly. But <laughs> before we get into all that, do you have a little fast fact to whet our appetite that might be true, might be false? I do, Kurt. I do have a, a fast fact that hopefully it will whet your appetite and um, ideally whet some other things for those listening. Um, your curiosities, that is. You're a wild man. We're getting wild already. Come Listen, on. Listen, <laughs> I heard wild and, and uh, I mean, we're getting wet and wild, I guess. We haven't even gotten to the West yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kurt. So true or false, Kurt? Woodrow Wilson was a huge cinephile and he traces the origin of his love for cinema for when he saw a movie of a train heading to the camera And he genuinely freaked out and thought the train was coming from the other side. And since he watched this movie as a kid, he developed a love of cinema, which eventually led to him installing a cinema in the White House and showing the birth of a nation. True or false? Oh, wow. That was <laughs> so much of a uh, several punch combo in a row. Because, cause I, you know, uh, well, Luis, you obviously know this, but for anyone our, in our audience listening, uh, I'm, I'm a uh, person who works in filmmaking. So That's correct. a lot of these things I tangentially know. Okay, so you're, you're talking about one of the first movies ever shown, which was, I think, called like A Train Comes Into the Station yeah, or right. something, yeah. where it was just literally a train arriving in the station. Yeah. But I do know that people in the audience got freaked out that they literally were going to get hit by a train. It sounds familiar that Woodrow Wilson was a big film fan. And I know that Birth of a Nation was a super big movie and was shown at the White House. Mm-hmm. Man, if only I knew the, the information of when <laughs> Woodrow Wilson was president. This is like all on me. <laughs> you know what? I've got like all the tangential pieces about this. Let me just let me just hedge my bets and say I think it's true. Okay, I, I know that that Birth of a Nation was like the movie that everybody and their brother saw back in the day, and a train <laughs> did in fact come into the station. <laughs> I guess maybe Woodrow could have been in the audience. So be it. It's true. I was gonna say, Kurt, that's the only movie that was in theaters at the time. What else were you gonna watch? <laughs> there was like a choice between the Birth of a Nation and, and like five minutes of a guy singing jazz, <laughs> which is also rare. regardless of which you choose it's problematic i got you either way well kurt uh basically the premise of this was that woodrow wilson was one of the first people to get a like jumped uh from seeing the train come one of the first movies ever shown and so wow he was in the audience for that that's amazing no that's false that's false kurt i made that you go oh never mind (laughs) ridiculous Uh, no, Curtis, uh, that, that's a false story. He did show Birth of a Nation in in the White House, and it was one of the first movies ever shown in the White House. Uh, it's a shame that it was that one. But just for your context, Kurt, he was president during World War One, So early 1900s is when Woodrow Wilson was president. Right. Yeah. That's kind of what I was thinking. It was the right time for Birth of a Nation, but I, I feel like maybe a little late in history for a train comes into a station. Mm. I don't know. <laughs> Is it ever the right time for Birth of a Nation, Kurt? <laughs> <laughs> Just Do you ever have to hand it to the president for premiering Birth of a Nation in the White House? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know, Kurt. I mean, talk to every single film major around the country that had to watch Birth of a Nation because it's, quote, culturally relevant for <laughs> modern filmmaking. Me included. By the way, <laughs> three-hour movie. I watched it. <laughs> 
That's right. Well, thank you, Kurt. All right. Well, racist films aside, let's get into these stories, okay? So, as I said, we're going west. And before I get into this first story, Luis, I just want to let you know the name of our main character here so we can both enjoy it, okay? This main character in our uh, western story that we will make wild is Elmer McCurdy. All right. Okay. So let's just dive right into it. Okay. So January 1st, 1882, we're in Harrisonburg, Virginia. This is the date that Elmer McCurdy was born. And Elmer's mother was a 17 year old girl named Sarah McCurdy. Sarah was unmarried, but she told Elmer that his father had died of typhoid fever. Now, somewhat ironically, Sarah herself would die of typhoid fever in 1893 when Elmer was 11 years old. Mm. And after his mother's death, Elmer was taken care of by his grandparents named Adelia and Elmer. Uh, I I assume this is grandfather Elmer that he's named after. But anyway, things go well for several months until Elmer, this is grandson Elmer we're talking about, happens to mention his father dying of typhoid fever. Okay. Now, Elmer's grandparents tell him that his father was slash is a drunk who had fled town when he found out Sarah was pregnant. So he might actually even still be alive out there. Yeah. And learning this information was sort of Elmer's villain origin moment. <laughs> because after this, he started acting out and getting into a lot of trouble. Another way you could also look at this though is that learning this information at age 11 after just losing your mother would be extremely distressing and have a pretty large effect on someone so you know you can kind of go glass half full or glass half empty yeah and and just imagine kurt i mean the distress you can go as a small boy when you're named after glue that's true although you know we're we're way back in like the 1880s here so maybe they don't have the glue yet maybe the glue is going to get named after him for all you know hold on is this foreshadowing kurt maybe that's the end of the story he invented glue oh i i I guess (laughs) it right calling it right now it's true (laughs) did did you know this true story also Luis? you better tell me now so we can stop recording (laughs) (laughs) stop the podcast not for anything problematic but because i've got apollo's gift of prophecy stop the podcast this time for meta reasons (laughs) (laughs) it doesn't advance the plot so whether you're you know giving elmer a little credit that he's going through a rough time or seeing it as this is his moment to become a villain uh either way he starts acting out and in 1895 elmer's grandparents got tired of putting up with him so they sent him to live with his aunt and uncle in Joplin, Missouri. Nice. Now Elmer's uncle Jacob tried his best to put Elmer to work on the family farm in Joplin, but he also found Elmer to be a handful. And also adding to the problems here, shortly after moving to Missouri, Elmer developed a bit of a drinking problem, which I would say to Elmer, try getting out of southern Missouri. I I get it. You know, change the scenery maybe will help. Go to Missouri and of course you develop a drinking habit. (laughs) We've all been there. We've we've all been been there, actually. Yeah, I think we've all have. We all have. (laughs) But either way, this leads to more and more conflict with Uncle Jacob until finally Elmer gets kicked out of the house in 1898 at age 16. Now, during the next few years, Elmer struggled to hold a job very long because of his drinking problem. All in all, Elmer was fired from being a stable boy, a ranch hand, a textile factory worker, a bricklayer, and he even got denied from joining the U.S. Army. This was both because he was too young, but also when he tried to enlist, he was too drunk to spell his name correctly. So awesome. Hell yeah. Got rejected on a couple counts. Oh, <laughs> oh, that's amazing, Kurt. Oh, just imagine the confidence you have got to have to show up to the military office and not be able to spell your name. That's fantastic. I like this guy already. Just show up in the recruiter's office and say, <laughs> I'm ready to be shipped out and collapse on the floor. And assume that's good enough. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they're they like, hey, uh, son, what's your age? He says, yeah. <laughs> And walks out. <laughs> <laughs> so it didn't work out in the army, but finally in early 1903, Elmer got a job in a coal mine, and this one he seems to be able to hang on to for a while. While working in this coal mine, Elmer became friends with two other miners named Clyde Weber and Frank Gamble. Clyde Weber was a blaster in the coal mine, so at this point in time, the popular method for tunneling through rock is drilling and blasting. This is both for tunneling through rock if you're mining, but also if you're like building highways and there's rocks in the way or whatever. But basically, Basically, for drilling and blasting, first you would drill several holes in the rock, then fill them with dynamite, then you would seal this tightly with a non-combustible material so that the force gets directed towards the rock. And as dangerous as this sounds from the description, it's actually even a little bit worse because working with dynamite (laughs) is extremely volatile. You have to be super duper careful when you're handling sticks of dynamite. Mm -hmm. For example, if you had a stick of dynamite and you dropped a hammer on it, 
it would probably explode from there. Right. Dynamite also only has a shelf life of about a year before it starts to leak nitroglycerin. This is the chemical in dynamite that makes it explode. So not only is it dangerous to work with dynamite, but also any container that you're keeping it in might also be explosive if you're keeping it for too long. Amazing. All this to say that being a blaster is a pretty dangerous job that requires constant focus. Blaster? Okay, so... Hardly know her. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> so Elmer first becomes friends with Frank Gamble, who then introduced him to Clyde Weber. Frank and Clyde, it seems, find Elmer to be a little funny, if at times a bit unpredictable. And being a minor means that you're going to end up spending a lot of time in confined spaces with your coworkers. So you're kind of either bound to become close friends or hate each other absolutely to the death. In this case, the three of them became close friends. Now... At some point, it seems the three men decided that they were tired of being underpaid, and it seems kind of like it was Clyde leading the charge here, which honestly is fair since he's the one who literally might get blown up for his job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the group came up with a plan to rob the mining company's safe using mining tools and dynamite stolen from the job site. Oh, and yes. on the evening of March 3rd, 1909, they put this plan into action. However, somehow before they could get started with this, word about the heist had gotten out and the three men were apprehended and arrested as soon as they stepped foot on the mining company's property. For the record, the safe mostly contained documents relating to land rights and ownership of the mine and the money in the safe would have only added up to about a week's worth of salary for each of them. Yeah. So it wouldn't have been a really big haul, but they never even got to the point of seeing the safe. It's about sending a message, Kurt. That's true. It's it's about the principle of the matter. Exactly. Uh, but either way, they, they didn't get very far. When they were arrested, the men had in their possession two sticks of dynamite, three sets of work gloves, two crowbars, and a hammer. So they're caught pretty well red-handed here. After being arrested, Clyde Weber pled guilty to a burglary and was sentenced to six years in prison. However, Frank Gamble and Elmer McCurdy successfully convinced their juries that they sincerely believed they were just coming in to do some extra work after hours. Oh, uh, yes. When they're in court, the version of events that they give, Clyde told them that they needed to finish some blasting before an upcoming deadline. And since Clyde had been at the company significantly longer than them, he technically did outrank them and so he could give them instructions. So it was somewhat believable that they would follow his instructions without questioning. Uh, and it seemed to ultimately work because Frank and Elmer only got convicted of trespassing and served six months and eight months respectively. Now, after getting out of prison, Frank and Elmer reunited and relocated to Kansas to start on a life of crime. Yeah. Oh, I love it when what <laughs> radicalizes you to become a criminal is a crime, right? It's like it's like tasting human blood. You got a taste for it. You cannot go back. He felt what crime was all about. And then he said, this is my life going forward. They just barely dodged the consequences of their actions. And they said, let's put all our effort into doing that again. <laughs> I can relate so much to that, Kurt. I'm not going to lie. If, if I get away <laughs> with something, even if it's trivial, that is, is carte blanche for anything I might ever do in my life. That's just a sign you should try harder. <laughs> exactly. Maybe, maybe the, the person that's at fault here is not the one that's stealing, but the one that's having a hard time catching me. <laughs> So it seems that at some point in the, the process here, Clyde had given Elmer a basic education of using dynamite. Uh, this either happened while they were working together in the mine or during Elmer's time in prison because by coincidence, the two men had actually been assigned to the same cell block for most of Elmer's incarceration. Mm. But either way, Elmer's got like dynamite explosion 101 knowledge. And another thing that happened is somewhere along the way to Kansas, Frank and Elmer met a man named Jimmy Beecher, who actually happened to be from the same part of Virginia as Elmer. Jimmy becomes friends with them pretty quickly and joins their budding criminal enterprise. So they once again got a trio. <laughs> nice. Nice. In June 1910, the trio first attempted to rob a bank in Coffeyville, Kansas. So things at first went pretty well until Elmer tried to use dynamite to blow open the vault door. Elmer set the fuse and lit it, but somehow the fuse burned out without igniting the dynamite, which honestly is pretty impressive considering like how much I just described how volatile dynamite is. <laughs> but either way, it did not detonate the first time when he used the fuse and they did not have any extra fuses. So eventually the men were forced to flee empty handed. Awesome. Hell yeah. It's like a it's like a Looney Tunes cartoon. You just almost almost hear them uh like doing the the run sound effect. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, and running in place for a moment before they skedaddle out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they, they had to they had to skedaddle out of there. 
So on July 2nd, 1910, they decided to try again. This time they attempted to rob a bank in Fort Scott, Kansas, and they were able to successfully detonate the dynamite this time, but clearly did not use enough because the explosion only scorched the vault door, but did not significantly damage it. Certainly not in a way where they could get it open. So after the first explosion, they had no more dynamite left. And again, they were forced to flee. Uh, uh, hold on, hold on, Kurt. I, I, I got this. I got this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly like that. <laughs> okay, so attempt number three, August 19th, 1910. This time the trio, they've pivoted a little bit. They're going to try to rob a train this time. So somehow they had heard a tip about a train that had a safe on board that could contain as much as $4,000. This would be Whoa. about $150,000 in modern money. Now, after halting the train at gunpoint, the men located the train safe in the cargo car and Elmer planted three dynamite charges. And as you might imagine, Luis, a train safe is significantly smaller than a bank vault. So yeah. three dynamite charges turned out to be way too much explosive oh. to use and nearly destroyed the safe entirely. The majority of the money in the safe was paper money. And of course, all of this money was burnt up and the rest of the money was in coins. Most of these melted to the sides of the safe. Oh. But between the coins that didn't melt and the ones that the men were able to pry off from the wall of the safe, they salvaged $110 before again being forced to flee. ka <laughs> Payday, baby. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah, not empty handed this time. Progress, you know, it's something. Come on. You know, when they finally uh, ran away, what that sounded like, right? Oh, please. <laughs> and that was the last time they saw them. <laughs> it is exactly like that, but with, with the jingle of $110 <laughs> in coins. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> now, on September 1910, it seems that Elmer finally got the dynamite quantities correct. The men robbed another train this time and managed to steal around $1,200 from the safe. Uh, when they blew open the safe door, though, they did have one unfortunate accident. Jimmy Beecher's hand was somehow exposed to the shrapnel from the explosion, and he ended up losing the use of two of his fingers. Oof. And after this robbery, Jimmy Beecher retired from his life of crime, or at the very least, retired from his life of crime with Frank and Elmer. We don't really know what he did after this but honestly it's understandable for him to get out of the game at this point do you get do you get pension for that like <laughs> no no re retirement no social security for a no, life of crime no 401ks for thieves and bandits unfortunately no it's a goddamn shame <laughs> now on the other hand the uh the the shrapnel free hand that is uh frank and elmer couldn't be happier about this because they finally did it right they they pulled off a robbery yeah that's right uh, they got it you know this big haul from it and so they celebrate by rapidly spending spending their money in various saloons in Kansas and Missouri, and of course getting drunk and bragging about what big bad outlaws they are. <laughs> and as you might imagine, Luis, this draws a lot of unwanted attention. So sure, ultimately yeah. to avoid the law catching up to them, Elmer and Frank decide to relocate to Oklahoma and plan their next heist. Now, once you've done a successful robbery, I feel like the next one kind of has to be like, go big or go home, right? That's right. Yeah. You're not going to go steal less than you did the time before. That would just be embarrassing. Of you know? course not, Kurt. That that looks bad on the resume. Especially for these guys who have had such a rough track record. Yeah, that's right. It, it's just not a professional look, okay? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's a high bar for them at this point. Now, luckily for Elmer and Frank, the perfect heist fell right into their lap. So to explain how they got this uh, perfect coincidence, let me go back and and take you on a short little tangent, Luis. Okay. During the 1880s, the Osage tribe were forced out of their homes in Kansas to be relocated to an Indian reservation in Oklahoma, and the land that they were relocated to was chosen because it was thought to be poor land. It was not very good for farming. However, in 1896, oil was discovered on the reservation lands, and we're not just talking about like a little bit of oil, but a lot of oil. Ugh. So if you know anything about the turn of the century, you know that everybody who had oil got absolutely stupid rich. Yeah, minted. And in this case, it's a little bit tricky because the Osage tribe doesn't technically own the land because in the eyes of the U.S. government, they don't really have full personhood, so they shouldn't be trusted with owning things. But Jeez. what they are able to do is lease the land out to oil companies for huge profits. In fact, in 1923, the tribe made over $30 million, which in modern money would be about $400 million. Uh, This made them the wealthiest people in the world per capita. And this is actually the background events that would lead to the famous series of murders talked about in Killers of the Flower Moon, which oh, if you haven't read yeah. the book or seen the movie, you should check that out. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Right now, it's still only 1911, so the Osage aren't record-breaking rich yet, but there's still a lot of money going through Oklahoma. 
Now, somehow Elmer and Frank find out about a train carrying $400,000 in Osage royalty payments, which you can just imagine them seeing dollar signs in their eyes at that number. That's right. Yeah. So on October 6, 1911, Elmer McCurdy and Frank Gamble stopped a train near Bartlesville, Oklahoma. However, after boarding the train, they quickly realized they had stopped the wrong train. This was just a regular passenger oh, train that they had flagged down. that's awesome. That's amazing. Imagine that. You stop <laughs> a train and it's the wrong one. Uh, it, it's it's not like grabbing the wrong pack of gum at 7-Eleven, Kurt. It's, it's a full train. Oh, my. The mental image of this <laughs> is fantastic, man. Holy cow. Oh, I'm, that made me so happy. So, you know, before I tell you what they do then, Luis, what, what would you do in this situation? You, you were expecting a train carrying $400,000 and you're on the, the regular schmegular train. What are you going to do now? I mean, frankly, uh, <laughs> I would probably, we've, I, I'd probably be of the mindset of, well, we've already stopped the train. Might, might as well get something out of it, no? If the train does not have $400,000. Take whatever you can get, that's baby. That's right. Yeah. If, if it doesn't have $400,000, it probably has about 30 people each with $2 each. Hey, that's that's rent, you know? <laughs> Yeah, well, it seems that that Elmer McCurdy and Frank Gamble were much of the same mindset as you because they also decide to just take whatever they can get. Yeah, master criminal brain I have. Master criminal brain. So uh, all in all, they get $23, the conductor's watch, and all the whiskey they can carry from the bar car. I think that's a better gamble. Yeah, no, uh, frankly. (laughs) Than $400,000? Listen, on the one hand, you've got $400,000, which is what? A million or so in today's money? Or like Mm -hmm. 12 crates of whiskey? Awesome. You're like, you fail to understand how much whiskey these guys can carry, okay? (laughs) It's a lot of whiskey. (laughs) Yeah, their pockets, big. Actually, they they brought their camelbacks. You you will not expect just (laughs) how much whiskey these guys can carry on their person. Well, after this semi-successful robbery, Elmer and Frank split up. And later that day, Elmer showed up at the local saloon trying to trade the conductor's watch for a bottle of whiskey, which it seems evidently the bartender took him up on because Elmer did, in fact, get his bottle of whiskey and then proceed to get absolutely shwasted. Awesome. Do you just go home once the robbery's over? (laughs) <laughs> like you've stopped a train <laughs> what now right you've completed your task do you just leave i guess right yeah you know i think normally you you go home and if you're smart hide your money you know under the mattress or something or if you're elmer spend your money really fast but it, it's it's a level of more complicated for elmer because i don't think he really has like a home in this area i mm. think he's just kind of living like wherever he can stay he's doing like the the gilded age version of couch surfing you know uh, yeah. in between train robberies so okay. yeah. there's not really like a place for him to sleep other than wherever he ends up passing out once he gets his conductor's watch traded for the whiskey <laughs> that's oh my goodness that s- simple life man frankly head empty just thinking about train robbers you don't have and, to worry about honestly, rent man we could live by that yeah yeah that's respectful that's power to the workers man that's so true you you live off the land live off the fat of the land and and the fat of the train schedule yeah, i was gonna say i yeah, forget the fat of the land you're living off the trains of conductors <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the watches of conductors. The fat of the FDIC. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So Elmer does, in fact, trade this watch for a bottle of whiskey, I'm assuming, because he gets a bottle of whiskey and later has no conductor's watch. He proceeds to get pretty wasted on this said whiskey and in his usual fashion starts bragging about his shenanigans and criminal escapades. Now, by complete coincidence, one of the other men in the saloon was a sheriff named Bob Fenton. And Bob was actually visiting family in Pawhuska, Oklahoma, but just a few days before that, he'd been busy investigating a series of bank robberies in Missouri. One of these bank robberies, which Elmer is now describing to him in a surprising amount of detail. Yeah. So it does not take very long for Sheriff Bob to put two and two together here. And when he goes to arrest Elmer, a fight breaks out, which quickly ends with Elmer being shot in the chest and killed. No! Our hero. I know. That's, that's you know, it, it comes quick. <laughs> Ultimately, Elmer was remembered as a sort of odd character who never had much success on either side of the law. But I will say, Luis, after his death, he was commonly referred to as, quote, the bandit who wouldn't give up for his persistence in his life of crime. Yeah, I would say that, too. I, that's how I want to be remembered. You, you would say he's, he's a bandit who wouldn't give up or you're a bandit who wouldn't give up. I am a bandit that would give up easily, frankly. But we're not talking about me here. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> 
know, Kurt, Kurt, <laughs> Kurt, listen, for someone that likes to call people cowards, I am a wuss, okay? I am probably the biggest <laughs> coward of them all. I'm, I'm not upset to, to accept it, to, to, to say it, you know? You'll hear many things come out of this mouth, but hip hypocrisy, never, okay? But I respect it. I respect it when someone, you know, does something with their life other than a history podcast. You know, most people don't know this, but uh, before we did the podcasting, Luis was actually going to be a bank robber. But That's the right. But Fuses didn't light the dynamite the first time, and then he was like, I'm out. I'm doing the podcasting. The optics so that, that, were that does strange. actually ring pretty true. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first story. That's that, <laughs> awesome. I love that it just ends. <laughs> so he shot in the chest. What do you want him to do? Get up and walk around? I mean, that's that's death is pretty final, Luis. That, I I told you right from the get go that Elmer McCurdy was our main character. You know, what, after he's dead, what more can he do? I don't know. Like he's just a corpse at that point. I don't know. I mean, listen, Maximilian of Habsburg. Once he died, he went on a whole journey. His corpse went on a whole journey. That would be pretty good. Sometime we should have a we should have a podcast where it's like like a, a guy dies and then his corpse has like a whole other journey that's like happening after. That's that's nice. He's, you know, kick yeah. the That's cool. Well, I think the best way to get into this is just to dive straight into it. Okay, so let's let's just let's just go straight for it. All right, mm. we are in October seventh, nineteen eleven, in the town of Pawhuska, Oklahoma. Oh, we're in the same region. And in the town of Pawhuska, Oklahoma, the town undertaker was a man named Joseph Johnson. And on this day, Joseph Johnson had just been delivered the corpse of a man named Elmer McCurdy. What? Now, McCurdy had been an outlaw who tried to rob banks and trains using dynamite, but never had much success on either side of the law until he was shot by a sheriff. Oh. It's not really a very interesting story, so I won't talk what? too much about it, but maybe I'll tell you sometime. Uh Oh, no. Anyway, Joseph Johnson examined McCurdy's body and determined he was killed by a single gunshot wound to the chest. At the time of his death, he had tuberculosis as well as mild cases of both pneumonia and trichinosis. And Joseph Johnson embalmed the body using an arsenic-based preservative. Uh, this was commonly done this time with deceased who had no local next of kin since they weren't sure how long the body would be waiting to be claimed. So arsenic is going to keep the body preserved for a pretty long time. He also shaved McCurdy's beard and dressed him in a suit and then stored him in the back of the funeral home. Oh, oh no. Oh no, <laughs> you're oh, getting no. nervous, Luis? <laughs> I am, I'm sweating. <laughs> so time passed and no one came to claim the body of Elmer McCurdy. And because no one had come to claim the body, this also meant that Joseph Johnson had not been paid for his services because he wouldn't get paid until a family member came to get the body and then would pay him for the embalming process. So because he hadn't been paid, Joseph Johnson refused to release the body or permit it to be buried because, you know, he wants his money. And after a long period of time with no one coming to get the body, it seems that Joseph Johnson decided to find another way to get his money. He dressed Elmer's body in street clothes and put a rifle in his hand and stood him up in the corner of the funeral home. He then charged customers five cents to see the body of, quote, the bandit who wouldn't give up. Oh, hell yeah. Which, frankly, I think is a, is a pretty good name. Wow. Other names that Johnson would refer to McCurdy as sometimes were, quote, the mystery man of many aliases or the Oklahoma outlaw or the embalmed bandit. So he's got kind of a variety of, of uh, identities here going on. The embalmed bandit, man. You had so many other things at your disposal and you went with the easiest thing. Come on. Don't like the guy anymore. <laughs> Don't like the guy. If he considered just the embalmed bandit as a likely marketing term, nah, 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 nah. Not into it. Sorry. Well, you know, you knock his showmanship, Luis, but he did manage to make Elmer McCurdy's corpse a fairly popular attraction. Thank God. Even drawing the attention of several carnival and circus promoters who tried to buy the corpse. Yes. Uh, but Johnson turned down all of these offers. But Elmer McCurdy's corpse as the bandit who wouldn't give up was a pretty big feature. And he ended up staying on display in Johnson's funeral home for about five years. Oh. Until October 6th, 1916, when a man named Aver contacted Joseph Johnson. So Aver told Johnson that he was Elmer's long-lost brother from California and he had made arrangements with an Osage County Sheriff and attorney to pick up the body and have it transported to San Francisco for a proper burial. Now the next day Aver arrived at Johnson's funeral home with his brother Wayne and the two of them collected the body and boarded a train that they told Johnson was headed for San Francisco. However, these men were not Elmer's brothers. In fact, their names were not even Avers or Wayne. Their what? real names were James what? and Charles Patterson, oh. and they were brothers and owners of the Great Patterson Carnival Shows, a oh. traveling oh. circus. Hold on. Johnson just gave them the body? He was like, okay, I trust them. Sure. What? 
Come on. I mean, from what I can tell, they weren't lying about coordinating with an Osage County Sheriff and attorney. And also keep in mind, this guy's like had this body on hand for five years and he's kind of waiting for people to show up and pay him for it. So he probably doesn't really care too much who it gets given to as long as they like claim that they're the brothers. Oh, you know, gosh. Elmer was an outlaw, so he didn't really have like a family line they could trace back. So there's not really like a verification process for this. They should have tracked down his drunk father. <laughs> oh, sorry. You, you have you're yet to tell me the story of Elmer. Sorry. Sorry, uh, I'll be quiet. <laughs> Either way, James and Charles transport Elmer's body to Arkansas City, Kansas, to be featured in their circus as, quote, the outlaw who would never be captured alive, which I guess is, like, technically That's true. nice, yeah. Oh, that's good. They featured him for several years until 1922 when the Pattersons used Elmer McCurdy's corpse as a safety deposit to get a $500 loan from a man named Louis Sonny. Great. Ah. Oh. Good. And unfortunately, it seems that they failed to pay back this $500 loan, so Louis Sonny kept the corpse. What? L- l- wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Quick quick interruption, dude. 1922 was a better time to be alive, okay? Like, <laughs> you could get away with anything. What is your collateral for a loan? Oh, I don't know. I've got this corpse lying around. Oh, okay, yeah. Send it in. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Oh, man. $500, too. You know, in 1920, $500 is a lot of money. And you're just like, I got this dead body laying around. And, and, you know, like, listen to me. Like, I like listen, I have nothing wrong with paying taxes, okay? The problem I have is bureaucracy. If If someone came to my door and asked me, hey... You owe me $800. I don't know. I will pay it right then and there. But when you have to do all this whole process, that's when I get frustrated. That's when I get stressed out. But then I realize that it hasn't always been this way. It could have been 1922, just a little over 100 years ago. And someone needs a loan? Oh, uh, uh, I've got an embalmed body ready for you. Does that work? And not being (laughs) surprised at the fact that they say yes. Okay, that's the best part about this. Like the the way you're saying this, Kurt, it almost sounds like a near daily occurrence or maybe not daily, but a regular occurrence. Imagine moving into a new apartment and they're like, oh, did you have to, to put up first month's rent for the safety deposit? No, I just had to put up the body of the outlaw who wouldn't quit. <laughs> <laughs> I just had the, the, the body of, of the, the outlaw who would never be captured alive laying around. I put that man up. I had a shrunken head that my uncle gave me when I was 10 years old. And they accepted it. They took it. Gave me a loan, no questions asked. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> like, that's awesome. I'm sorry. If, if, if anything, this is making me more excited for the past. And I, I'm not one to get very nostalgic for the past. But this, this really tugs at some heartstrings that I did not know existed. Yeah, you know, if, if you discovered a time machine and you were going to go back in time, people could, could say there's like, you know, big problems or, or like huge discomforts with any time period you're going to go back to. But frankly, I mean, in the 20s, you can trade a dead body for $500. Uh, and, and that's just the facts of life. Okay, so, I mean, try to stop me from going back to the 20s. What are that's, you going to do? That's so that's, good. That's, that's, it's an amazing time. It's that's a magical so place. That's so good. There's no war yet. The big one's over. The economy <laughs> is going up and up. We just had the last war. Everything's perfect. Yeah, that's right. You, Banks will never fail. You just had the war that ended all wars. We're never going to die. It's 1922. Nothing could go wrong. <laughs> and And, you know... Speaking of like the wildness of America back in this time, because you may be thinking like for the person who is, you know, going to if they default on the loan, just going to receive a dead body like they, they've kind of, you know, <laughs> got a raw deal here. Well, it turns out in 1920, you can still make a pretty good living off possessing the, the right. dead body of a former outlaw. Right. Because uh, this on. was actually kind of Louis Sonny's plan from the start. Uh, I mean, come even just that sentence, Kurt. All else fails. You've got a dead body to rely on. People would pay anything. <laughs> they had so much money just lying around. They were they were wanting to find out what the craziest thing they could spend it on was. And honestly, like I'm not I'm not one to 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 really compliment the accumulation of capital and making money, but when you're making ends meet with the absolute funniest thing you can find, I respect it. Well, you know, Luis, I'm glad you're on board with this because I'll tell you, this is, you know, one one stop in in a series of many stops this body is going to make, okay? This, I, this body God. Uh, is a moneymaker for many people. You know, it's a magical time where you could just have uh, the corpse of a dead outlaw and get rich off it. 
the American dream. But so the Patterson brothers default on this $500 loan. And so the body goes to Louis Sonny. And as I said, this is actually a pretty good deal for Louis Sonny. Let me give you a little background on him. So Louis Sonny had formerly been a police officer in Washington State. After only a couple years of being a cop, Louis quit and moved to L.A. to start his own entertainment company. And he produced and directed movies about the consequences of a life of crime. He was kind of like the OG dare guy. Ooh, yeah, nice. He also had a traveling wax museum of famous outlaws called the Museum of Crime. And so Elmer's corpse was added to the Museum of Crime, displayed along wax figures of famous outlaws like Bill Doolin and Jesse James, if you know who those names mm-hmm, are. Mm-hmm. Louis displayed Elmer's corpse in his museum for the next 30 years. God, 30 years. In addition to displaying in this traveling museum, he also made money by renting his figures out as sideshows or props. And this, of course, included Elmer's body. In 1928, Elmer's corpse was part of a wax museum sideshow for the Trans-American foot race. This was literally a foot race that took place from L.A. to New York. And then in 1923, Elmer's corpse was rented to director Dwayne Esper, and he used his corpse to promote his new film called Narcotic! Exclamation mark. Ooh. He displayed Elmer's body in the lobby of theaters, claiming it was the body of, quote, a dead dope fiend who had killed himself while being surrounded by police after attempting to rob a drugstore. So nice. pretty dramatic scene there. And Luis, you might be wondering, at this point, it's been 22 years since Elmer died. So how is his body holding up? You know, what does it physically look like at this point? You know, I was just thinking about this. I mean, you mentioned that they covered him in arsenic because... Sometimes it takes a little longer for people to claim the body, right? So this certainly, sure, it it was Mm -hmm. more lasting than, I don't know, other embalming fluids. But it certainly could not have been enough for a body to make it 30 years. That's all I'm going to say. I'm sure this looked more like a mummy or just more of a corpse rather than an embalmed body. Right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, anybody who knows anything about the embalming process knows that it is pretty uniquely difficult to stop a body from decaying. Although I will say it seems that arsenic is a pretty amazingly good preservative. Mm. It stopped being used just before World War II, and this was only because it was toxic. But mm. apparently it's really, really good as an embalming fluid because Elmer's body was still fully intact and mostly undecayed. Really, the only damage that had happened was his skin had dried out and shriveled, so the entire body had shrunk a bit so his skin is like you know kind of cracked and mummified but this is no problem for a showman like Dwayne Esper because he just tells people that the corpse's shriveled skin is a result of a lifetime of drug use so it still just plays into promoting his movie because of heroin of course (laughs) he was a junkie this is what it looks like this is your skin on drugs this man snorted one marijuana and now his skin peels from his fingers anyway buy the movie ticket (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> finally in 1949 louis sunny died and his son dan took over the museum of crime dan put elmer's corpse in storage in a warehouse in la where it then sat for 15 years oh god in 1964 dan let director david friedman use elmer's corpse as a prop in his 1967 film titled she freak And in 1968, Dan sold Elmer along with some other wax figures to the owner slash founder of the Hollywood Wax Museum, who was a man named Spoonie Singh. Elmer was displayed in the Hollywood Wax Museum as, quote, the 1,000-year-old man. For the record, at this point, he was born in 1880, so he's only 88 years old. But, you know, that's showbiz, baby. You're in, you're in L.A. You got you to gotta make it work. Fake it till you make it. He was 1,000 in outlaw years. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Something. They, they, got, they got some kind of math going on there. Now, at some point, it seems that Spoonie lent Elmer's corpse out to be used in a temporary display in front of Mount Rushmore. And, Luis, would you mind explaining for anyone who doesn't know what Mount Rushmore more is because it is a bit of an odd landmark honestly of course uh, mount rushmore is an art piece i guess you could call it that displaying the heads of four different presidents of the united states if i recall correctly it's uh, george washington thomas jefferson uh, teddy roosevelt and abraham lincoln right am i missing any of them who knows maybe i've got a precedent off there who knows but it's four precedents some of the most impressive presents, but what's, what's most astounding and most fantastic about Mount Rushmore is that it was carved into a mountain. It was carved uh, more specifically onto the Black Hills, 
of what is it, South Dakota, I believe. Yeah, you know, it, it, frankly, it's kind of like a very perfect American monument because I'll say you're like listing the presidents and the state where it is, and I really don't know, honestly. Yeah. But that, that's what makes it a perfect American monument is that we spent a bunch of time carving it into a rock so we could proudly display four faces of presidents that I can't identify right now in a state which I can't identify right now, and we're super duper proud of that. It's a, it's an incredible, uh, like you said, it's a really good sign of the U.S. because the Black Mountains uh, or the Black Hills are actually very much sacred to the native people of that area and have been for thousands of years. So for us to just just paste on there the picture of American colonialism uh, for white precedents on there. That, <laughs> I think it's frankly one of the most American monuments that could ever exist in the country. Well, for a brief, beautiful moment in time, the cherry on top of the Mount Rushmore ice cream sundae was a display featuring Elmer's corpse. Now, unfortunately, what? while Elmer's corpse was being displayed in Mount Rushmore, it was badly damaged in a windstorm, so many of his fingers and toes and the tips of his ears were blown off. Oh. And when the body was finally returned to L.A., Spoonie Singh decided that it was too damaged and no longer lifelike enough to display. Wait, how th did they just hang him in the middle of the heads? Like, <laughs> like how was he on Mount Rushmore? You failed to explain this. They, I mean, they had him out there in front of it for some reason, but I honestly don't know in what capacity. And, you know, keep in mind, at this point, he's been an outlaw, a dope fiend, you know, everything else. I mean, that's right. A thousand year old man, Yeah, a thousand year old man. And, you know, keep in mind, people at this point also don't know that this is going to become important timeline and history later. So he could have also been displayed as other props in other movies that I don't know about. Mm, right. um, so, frankly, he could have really been anything in front of Mount Rushmore, but it was real windy and it blew off some extremities that's that's right. what we do now when he finally got back to la spoonie decided that the body was too damaged and no longer lifelike enough to display so he sold the body to a man named ed Leersch, who is the owner of the pike which was an amusement park on the shoreline in long beach california ed Leersch had elmer's corpse bolted to a coffin and rigged to twitch because it got kind of like a haunted house thing going on and one important note at this point in time Luis, is that it seems people have completely forgotten that elmer is in fact a real human corpse uh it's unclear exactly what when this happened, but as far as they know at this point, he's like a wax figure or wow. a prop or something, but not a real human body. Right, yeah. God, that's terrifying in a way. Imagine imagine people forget you were ever a human. I know, and you know, one kind of gruesome detail of this is that the worker who actually physically bolted Elmer into the coffin later described how when he drilled through Elmer's foot, a gooey yellow liquid oozed out, but Ugh. at the time he was just kind of like, oh, that's weird, and then like went on with his day. That's disgusting. Now, a year later, Ed Leersh's company defaulted on their lease for the Pike, so all of the props were seized by the Long Beach Amusement Company, so <laughs> once again, Elmer's core goes up in the uh you know the defaulting on the uh, loan mm -hmm. but for some reason after this happened elmer's body was stored in the closet of an electrician for the pike named ray scott for about a year nice after this year passed ray painted elmer a bright reddish orange and then hung his body from a noose in a haunted house at the pike called laugh in the dark and by the way just for for context it's laugh spelled l-a-f-f -F. <laughs> yeah so yeah. you know we're, we're really in some some old-timey stuff here now, four years later, in 1976, the Laugh in the Dark haunted house was being used to film an episode of the TV show The Six Million Dollar Man. <laughs> One of the production workers tried to move Elmer's body, only for Elmer's arm to break off in his hand. <sighs> and then, you know, immediately inside the broken off arm, they can see flesh and bone. And quickly, the production crew realized this was a real human body. So production was halted <sighs> and the police were called. And everyone starts trying to find out who this corpse is and how it could have possibly ended up at the pike. Luckily, Elmer's body was still pretty well preserved, aside from the missing fingers and toes. In fact, at this point in time, he even still had some hair on his head, oh. which is frankly pretty impressive. Yeah, good for him. Good job. So a doctor named Dr. Joseph Choi performed the second autopsy on Elmer. Uh, at this time, it's been about 65 years since his first one. So I'd say he's like due for an update, you know. Now, during this autopsy, Dr. Choi finds scars from the previous autopsy. He also finds a scar on Elmer's right wrist that was sustained in a bar fight when he was still alive. Inside the body, they find a significant amount of arsenic. 
They also find part of the bullet that killed Elmer, which was identified as a gas check bullet, which was a type of bullet only used in the early 20th century, so this kind of led them towards who this person was. Dr. Troy also found tuberculosis still present in Elmer's lungs, <laughs> and then in Elmer's mouth they found a penny from 1924 and a ticket stub from Louis Sonny's Museum of Crime. <laughs> so with these many clues, it only took a few days to identify Elmer and trace his journey from Paw Huska to Long Beach. And as you can imagine, Luis, Elmer's corpse became absolutely the most exciting story of the week. Suddenly, everybody wants a piece of this guy. Funeral homes all over L.A. were offering to bury Elmer for free. A museum in Missouri wanted to acquire him for a permanent display. And even the Pike wanted to try to get him back because they were like, that's our prop. We own that. Send him back yeah. to us. Yeah, wow. Finally, the police agreed to release Elmer's body to a historical society in Oklahoma, who then transported him to Guthrie, Oklahoma, to be buried and on april 22nd 1977 elmer was finally buried in summit view cemetery in guthrie 66 years after his death approximately 300 people attended the service and interestingly elmer was buried next to outlaw bill doolin whose famous wax figure he had been displayed next to for years finally to ensure elmer wouldn't be further disturbed they poured two feet of concrete on top of his grave <laughs> and as far as i know Luis, that is where he still rests today in guthrie then in guthrie oklahoma yeah Fi at long last they buried the man <laughs> you know if, if anything i wish he would have made it longer i wish he would have made it to the turn of the century i wanted to see someone put a blackberry or a zune in this man's hand and watch it immediately break off that would have been lovely he, he could have had one more good stretch as a chuck e cheese animatronic mm. you know yeah you know if steve jobs have gotten a hold of this man uh he probably would have tried to eat him as one of his alternative medicines you know much like victorians did back in the day a little mumia little, little late stage mumia a little late stage mumia i think we're, we were all missing out on on this critical part of this man's life or this man's death really that is really really intriguing that your takeaway from the story is should have kept the body rattling around longer and then ate it <laughs> <laughs> you already kept it for 65 plus years, Kurt. Come on. At this point, burying it now and saying, oh, now no one's going to bother with this guy almost seems disingenuous. Well, I don't know, Kurt. Right? That's a good point. It is, it's like a little late. Yeah. It's like being a smoker your entire life, like three packs a day. And after you've been doing three packs a day for 15 years, you're like, mm, I'm done. Also, I just got diagnosed with lung cancer. You know, <laughs> like. <laughs> like, okay, yeah, the damage is done, man. All right, you've convinced me, Luis. May as well eat his corpse. That's what I'm saying, man. I think there was still <laughs> juice to get off of this guy. And by juice, I mean that yellowy liquid that oozed off of him when you removed an arm. Oh, ye old gooey yellowy ooze that we found. <laughs> it's the forbidden arsenic-laced man juice. God, what I'd give to give a taste. Well, Luis, I, I promised you that we were getting some wild Western things. I mean, we did certainly go West in this story because we even got a pretty significant portion in California. And I, I think you would agree that we got pretty wild here. That, I would say wild, yeah. I mean, you were, you were teasing it as to being no much more exciting than just a nice mild West, but... We got, we got the hot sauce, Kurt. We got the hot sauce. We moved past mild real quick. Yeah, and you know, be beneath uh, just the wildness of these stories, let's let's not pretend that we're not both thinking about the fact that uh, these stories are directly connected to each other, one running right into the other. I mean, you know, I'll leave it to you to, to talk through that process once you get to the deliberation phase. But before that, I do have one more interesting tidbit to tell you, Luis. Okay. So... Obviously, one of these stories is going to be true in the end, right? Now, whichever one of these is the true story, I want to tell you where I found out about this story from. So, the true story that I have told you today, whichever one it is, I found out because my mom saw an off-Broadway musical based on that story. Okay. So, while you're doing your, your deliberation, whichever story you think is true, just keep in mind, there's an off-Broadway musical about it. Oh, my God. I don't know if this is going to be easier <laughs> or make it more difficult, but I think before I, I, I think it's going to be more fun for me to go through that while we go through our favorite, least favorite part of the show, Kurt, which of course is deliberation. deliberation. Uh, Kurt, 
I'm not even going to ask so you to remind me of Louise, the story. No, 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 no. Shut up. I'm not. Don't even remind me of the stories. They're fresh in my mind. And, <laughs> okay. and first of all, Kurt, you know, you're the one editing this episode today, right? I want you to include here that point in between stories, essentially off the record when I said, God, all I want is someone to, I want someone's story to keep going after they're dead. And you saying, oh yeah, wouldn't that be crazy? <laughs> I want you to, to edit that in right now, right here, please. You know, what, after he's dead, what more can he do? I don't know. Like he's just a corpse at that point. I don't know. I mean, listen, Maximilian of Habsburg, once he died, he went on a whole journey. His corpse went on a whole journey. That would be pretty good sometime. We should have a we should have a podcast where it's like like a, a guy dies and then his corpse has like a whole other journey that's like happening after. That's after nice. He's, you know, kick yeah. the bucket. That's cool. I mean, does does do I feel bad at a certain point kicking you while you're down? No, frankly, no. That and that's why this podcast works. I see. <laughs> oh. I I knew it was going to be in the whole time, Luis. Okay, this has been a game of my design. God, you're Please terrible, deliver. man. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and start with the with, uh, at the end of the day. I'm not deciding over two different stories. I'm I'm deciding about I'm deciding between the background or what happened. Right now, Kurt, uh, this is just something that I'm thinking about. If I say that the second story is real, does that make the first story real as well? Or if the first story, okay, because I can see the second story being fake and the first story being real, but the second one, both of them could be real. Kurt, are you messing with me right now? It's very complicated, isn't it? One story is true, one story is false, Luis. Okay, well, <laughs> I hate you. And one is a musical. Don't forget that. <laughs> the record state, I despise you. <laughs> okay, so here's the thing. That second story was much longer than the first one, and that's leading me to believe that that's the real one. Mm. But I'm finding it very difficult to believe that the second story exists by itself without the first one. Right. Mm. So the, the 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 first one provides a good background for this guy to just die. But okay, here here's my train of thought. That second story is very much involved, right? A lot of things happened, and if that means that the first story is real, the first story was scarce in a lot of details, and in a way, just ends. Right? Bullet to the chest ends. So mm -hmm. if that story is the real one, it means that that tiny fraction of this man's story was plenty for you to come up with everything else. And <laughs> while, of course, Kurt, I don't doubt your, your creative capabilities, as a former theater kid, I can see the drama. I can see the excitement. I can see the music in this man's story, in the dead man's story. And I think that's a lovely thing. And I think that's a really wonderful thing. Oh wow! I I mean I can I can picture it right now. It's it's the traveling corpse. It's the it's the thousand year old man. It, it's the changing of hands going little by little every time. It's an ensemble cast, and a lot of different people are are even I'd say uh, they're they're casted in two different roles. My my theater brain's talking right now, and I can really picture <laughs> a, a production that will only ever debut in off-Broadway. And I'm thinking it's about the thousand-year-old man, about the bandit who changed hands for over 65 years after his death. So because of that, Kurt, I'm going to say that that's the real story. Wow. So even with all the information in this podcast, just based on the fact that one of these stories is a musical, we're going with the dead body that was passed around loaned out, defaulted on, painted and drilled through. That's musical material. What an insane call out. And you're absolutely right, Luis. That Ugh. is in fact a musical. Thank God. Off Broadway, but a musical nonetheless. That is fantastic. I was going to say if if the other one was the Broadway musical, they need to come up with better stories. No no wonder Off Broadway is failing. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm going to tell you the the truth of Elmer McCurdy's life, but first let me say, you know, if if people couldn't tell, you were struggling quite a bit there on the deliberation 
and just going back and forth deciphering things. Yeah. And one of the things that is super complicated that's kind of fun about this podcast is that if you have one story that references the other story, it means that the story that got referenced almost always has to be true. It's kind of like mm. a little bit of a paradox that it's kind of impossible to solve. Yeah. Uh, so I saw an opportunity to tell a story that referenced another story that also could be false and I thought this would be very fun to tell to you. And of course, the added bonus of one of these is a musical just made it too tantalizing to pass up. That's right. All that being said, here is the true story of the real life Elmer McCurdy. So Elmer McCurdy was born January 1st, 1880 in Maine. His parents were unmarried and also cousins. So Elmer was instead raised by his aunt and uncle. And at some point, Elmer's real mother told him the truth about who his parents were. This caused him to start acting out and develop a drinking problem. Then as a teen teenager, Elmer went to live with his grandfather and started working as a plumber. And in 1900, when Elmer was 20, both his grandfather and birth mother died. And at this point, Elmer's uncle had also passed away and he's not blood related to his aunt. So it seems like she's out of the picture. So basically with no family left, Elmer started drifting around the East Coast, unable to keep a job for very long because of his alcoholism. He later moved to Kansas and then to Missouri. And in 1907, he did in fact join the United States Army and was stationed at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Hmm. In the Army, he was to operate a machine gun and taught the basics of using nitroglycerin for demolition. And after being discharged from the army in 1910, Elmer met up with a friend to plan some sort of robbery in St. Joseph, Kansas. But only two weeks after being discharged, Elmer and his friend were arrested for possession of burglary paraphernalia. Uh. And the paraphernalia in question was chisels, hacksaws, nitroglycerin funnels, gunpowder, and money sacks. Which, when they say money sacks, they mean like a bag with a dollar sign drawn on it. Of course. I don't know. That just seems... Speaking of Looney Tunes, that's some real Looney Tunes stuff. They were they were using they were using a little raccoon mask too, <laughs> and a striped shirt. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, despite all this, in court, Elmer and his friend argued that the materials were for a new foot-operated machine gun they were working on inventing, and this evidently was convincing because they were released in January 1911. And after this, Elmer decided he would go all in on a life of crime, robbing banks and trains using nitroglycerin. So it is true that on at least one occasion on a train, <laughs> he used too much nitroglycerin and destroyed most of the money. <laughs> on another occasion in a bank, he managed to destroy most of the money in the vault without actually blowing the vault door open at all. And in his last robbery, Elmer did in fact attempt to rob a train he had heard about with royalty payments headed for the Osage tribe, only to get on the wrong train and ultimately only managed to steal $46, two jugs of whiskey, a revolver, a coat, and a conductor's watch, hey. which one local newspaper called the smallest amount ever stolen in a train robbery. <laughs> <laughs> also during this failed train train robbery, Elmer was identified somehow and a $2,000 reward was offered for his capture. But Elmer didn't know this, so he drunkenly went to sleep in the hayloft of a barn of a local ranch. And during the early morning hours, three sheriffs arrived and waited for him to come out. After several hours, Elmer shot at them through the door nice. and a gunfight ensued that lasted for another hour that ultimately killed Elmer. And at this point, Luis, you already know the rest. Thank God. So that is the story of Elmer McCurdy. Once again, not really successful on either side of the law, but all in all, he really was the band who would not quit because he just kept hanging out that's incredible i do love that I, I i do love when when someone that's relatively i guess uneventful in life ends up being incredibly famous for things that are difficult to attribute to them you know that's lovely and and, and if i ever die kurt i i i want to you know continue life after death and people not know exactly what i was all about if I ever die, Kurt, please burn every evidence of this podcast. Never happened. I want to be a full mystery. <laughs> it just goes to show there's always a chance for a second act, you know? Mm -hmm. People will be like, does Luis believe in a place after death? And I'll be like, oh, yeah, a good wax museum, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's less of a second act, Kurt. It's more of an encore, if you will. Oh, true. Very true. <laughs> like, come more on. Of an encore. Please. Everyone's clapping for more. It's just they didn't expect that it's, it was going to be me at a deli, you know, rotting away in a corner. <laughs> you know, I think there is something truly amazing about these stories and that, like, obviously, Elmer, the main character, is not present for... The 
the second half of his uh-huh. story here. You know, he didn't know that any of this happened. In his mind, he just died in, you know, relatively unknown state as a failed bank robber. Yeah. And not that you should really aspire to be a bank robber, but it just goes to show you never know which direction history is going to take. That's right. And I'm glad it took this direction. Especially, I think we, we go back to, you know, what we have been talking about in previous episodes, or even in this episode, how people were just so excited about the most random things back in the day. You know, I want there to be a circus and to be for there to be a circus as big as like the, the biggest MLS match in town. You know, I, I don't know if I'm choosing the right the right <laughs> comparisons here, but I, I want people to to hear the word embalmed corpse and say, hell yeah. Oh, oh, that's it right there. That's peak entertainment, baby. We want to see that. We'll yes. pay five cents to see that, baby. Everyone was happy to hear this. <laughs> Everyone is happy to see the embalmed corpse. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think the headline of these stories today is just that, like, man, history is weird. Because, you know, another thing that I keep thinking about is that he was an unsuccessful outlaw who then was having his real body displayed next to wax figure of Bill Doolin and then later was buried next to famed outlaw Bill Doolin. Yeah. Yeah. And for better or for worse, those two bodies will always be buried next to each other. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's, I think it just goes back to whether you, you succeed or fail in your life. Even that maybe is not the final say, because sometimes life is just so weird that even when you don't know about it, it's going to get you and you'll end up in a wax museum of crime. It could happen to you. You know, it's, it's more likely than you think, frankly. This guy's living my best life and he wasn't even alive. For, for all of it. That's amazing. Thank God. <laughs> well, I really pulled out all the stops with the mind games today, today Luis. I mean, I, I was combining, you know, these shenanigans with one story bleeding to the other. Plus, we have my real life mother entering into a cameo on this story, having seen it as a musical. <laughs> but nonetheless, it wasn't wasn't enough to fool you. You got that point. So that brings our score to five to two. Man, I don't know how I'm going to top that performance. I guess I'm just going to have to find something even weirder next go around. But but we'll see. I, I guess I'll, I'll figure it out. Either way, I, I did really enjoy telling you about, again, some stories that took place in the West that we made just a little wild. I agree, Kurt. I mean, Kurt, honestly, I'm ha- I've had a good time. I've enjoyed this. I was going to say, I don't even care that I've won. I mean, I do. I, I love that I've won. But <laughs> I think winning and also having a good time about it is good. It's good. We had a good time. Hope everybody listening also had a good time. I'm sure you did. If you didn't, get out of here. What, what, are, what are you doing here? If you going? didn't, why are you still here? <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of that, if you liked us, leave us a review. Tell your friends and family about it. If you want to get extra content from the episodes, pictures, check us out on our social medias. We're on Instagram at UnbelievablePod and Twitter at UnbelievablePC. Chicago listeners, catch us on WLUW Sundays at 1 p.m. And remember, everybody, take whatever you can get, baby. Bye. <laughs>